Okay, today we're going to dig deeper into the Gospels, and we are going to dig really deep. And I hate to shock you, but I'm going to show you errors in the Bible, in the New Testament. Oh, no. Are you ready? We're going to start with the Gospel of John, because we're going to, that's the Gospel I'm, I want to look at for a minute. Look at chapter 4, verse 3 through 5. Yeshua leaves Judea. And he goes again into the Galilee, and they had to go through Samaria. And then he came to a city of Samaria, which is called, it says Sychar, but that's Scam or Shechem, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. What does that mean? That means Jacob bought some land in Shechem and gave it to Joseph. Does that make sense? Does everyone understand that? Now, let's look at this next verse. Let's look at when this happened. In Genesis 33, 18 and 19, here Jacob comes to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. And when he came from Padanaram, and he pitched his tent before the city, and look at this, he purchased a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. Okay, the city of Shechem is named after a man named Shechem. And his dad is what? Who? Hamor. Does anyone know what Hamor means? The donkey. Eon, Eon, not Eeyore, Hamor. And so anyway, let's take a look at this map to make sure we get this understood. This is where Shechem is. In Samaria, okay, this is where Jacob bought a piece of ground and he gave it to his son, Joseph. Joseph is buried in Shechem. I've been there. I've seen his tomb. Now, where are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob buried? What city are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob buried? In Hebron. And we're going there this September to where they are buried. Now, so who did Abraham buy the cave of Machpelah from? What was the name of the person that Abraham bought the cave in the field from? Anybody remember? What? Ephron the Hittite. Okay, so Abraham goes and he gets ripped off. He pays way too much. But Ephron, or but Abraham buys land from Ephraim. Ephron in Hebron, whereas Jacob buys a piece of dirt from Hamor, the father of Shechem. Has everyone got that? Okay, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Can't peek, can't peek. Okay. Who bought the field in Shechem? Jacob, and he bought it from who? Hamor. Okay, who bought the field in Hebron? And he bought it from... Ephron. Okay, good. I saw some of you peeking, but <laughs> now I'm going to show you a big error in the New Testament. This is Stephen speaking in Acts chapter 7, verse 15 and 16. Jacob went down to Egypt and he came to his end there. And so did our fathers. And they were taken over to Shechem and put to rest in the place where Abraham got for price and silver from the sons of Hamor and Shechem. What? That's crazy. No. They went over to Hebron, not Shechem, and put to rest in the place Abraham bought in silver from Ephron the Hittite, not Hamor in Shechem. Oops. How many of you ever seen that error before? Anybody ever seen that error? Do you all understand how that's a big error? Okay. Well, there you go. I'm going to show you more. But how do you answer that? Are you saying the Bible's not inspired? Yes, I am. I'm telling you the Bible's inspired. And it is very accurate because Stephen, if you'll notice, look at Acts 7, 59. Stephen, while he was being stoned, made prayer to God saying, Lord Jesus, take my spirit. Stephen is about to be stoned. He's got his facts screwed up because he's a little nervous. So the Bible accurately tells us how he got it wrong. Okay. Stephen's about to be killed. He's nervous. I would screw up my facts too if I thought someone was about to kill me. So the Bible is correct because it didn't 
try to justify Stephen's mistake, it tells us Stephen is the one who said that, and he was a little messed up because he was about to get killed. So you follow me? It's not that the Bible is wrong. The Bible was truthful and telling us that he was a little nervous, and he got his facts wrong. Does that make sense? But you have to understand this. This is why, but you have to see there are mistakes in the New Testament, and I will show you some more. Okay, look at Acts 7.59. Oh, we just looked at that. Okay, let's go to 1 Samuel for a minute. Chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. Now, let me tell you, this is when the Philistines, you remember the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and they took it, they stole it, and they took it over to the Gaza Strip area. And then the Ark of the Covenant was knocking down their God and causing plagues. So they said, get this thing out of here. And they put it on a cart with some cows, and the cows took it back. This is what has just happened. But anyway, it says in 1 Samuel 7, 1 and 2, that the men of Kiriat Yarim came, and they took up the Ark of the Lord, and they brought it to the house of Abinadab, which is on a hill. And they consecrated his son, Eliezer, to have charge of the ark of the Lord from the day that the ark was lodged at Kiriat Yarim. And a long time passed, some 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Okay, so here we go. Here's my diagram. There's the hill of Abinadab. That's his house. And they take the ark and they bring it up there. So the ark was there for how many years? 20 years. Okay. Ark, 20 years. All right. Now, let's go to our next verse. I'm showing you the history before I show you the error. 1 Samuel 10, 24. This is after the ark was taken by the Philistines, and it was there for seven months, and then the Philistines bring it back, and then it goes up to the house of Abinadab, and then they decide that they want a king like all the other nations. Okay? So what happens? First Samuel 10, 24, Samuel says to everybody, Do you see the one whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted, Long live the king. Okay, so Saul is become king after the incident of the, with the Philistines. Let's jump to the next book, 2 Samuel, and let's look at, chapter 6, verse 2 and 3, it talks about how David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim, and they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Okay, so here we go. We're back at the house. 20 years goes by, right? 20 years and now David is king, and David takes it. And remember, Uzzah touches it, and he dies, and, God, and David's all upset. Remember that? Okay, how long was the ark at the house of Abinadab? 20 years. And we know Saul was anointed king after it was taken. And we know, and we're going to find out, that Saul dies, and then his son Ishbosheth rules for two years. So if you take the 20, and then David is, and he takes the ark up. He moves from Hebron to Jerusalem. So if you have 20 years, you subtract two years of Ishbosheth reigning. That makes it 18 years, okay? Then you also have uh, to go from how long it took from the ark of the covenant being taken to when Saul was king, but we know it was less than 20 years. Everyone agree it had to be less than 20 years because David took up the ark. <gasps> Well, let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 21. And here, someone's talking about history, and he says, And afterward, they desired a king, and God gave to them Saul, Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. Well, no, wait a minute. That's impossible. He couldn't have been king over 40 years, because the Ark of the Covenant was only there for 20 years, and David is the one who brought it out. So now, what do we do with that? Another error. Okay, now let's take a look. Let's see what happened. Uh, first off, David's son was Ishboseth. He's the one that became king for two years after Saul died. But he is 10 years older than David at the time. Okay, now 
How many sons did Jesse have? Let's take a look. In 1 Chronicles 2, 13 through 17, Jesse begat his firstborn, Eliab, and then Abinadab the second, and Shema the third, Nethaniel the fourth, Radai the fifth, Ozem the sixth, and David was the seventh. Well, no, wait a minute. I thought he had eight sons, and David was the youngest. How could he be the seventh? What's wrong here? Well, look at the next verse, 1 Samuel 17, 12. David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem and Judah named Jesse, who had how many sons? Well, how can he have eight sons, and David is the seventh, and he was the youngest? What is wrong with this picture? The Bible has an error. No, it doesn't. One of the sons died. He was probably in a military battle and died, so he had eight sons. But when Samuel came to anoint David, he was the seventh because the other one was dead. You see how you can reason these things? All right, so... That was a supposedly error in the Old Testament, but it wasn't when you understand again what's happened. But let's watch as this all unfolds. You have to remember, first off, in Numbers 1, 3, from 20 years old and upward, all in Israel were able to go to war. You and Aaron shall list them company by company. How old did you have to be to be drafted? 20. And in the story of Goliath, the three older sons are at the battle which means the other sons are all younger than 20. <sighs> Not hard math. Okay, and so when we look at that, if three of them are older and there's like four left, okay, well, one's got to be probably 19, 118, 117, 116. You know, David could have been 15 or 16 at this time. And then he had two sisters, it says. And we don't know exactly where the sisters were in there, but David was pretty young at this time. Well, take a look. We're going to go back now to 1 Samuel 4.11 and look at how this all unfolds. We see the ark of God was captured and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas die. Eli dies. He falls over backwards. His two sons die. Okay. Now, Eli was 98 years old when he died. Okay. He was born in the year 2778 from Adam. But now... The ark is taken. Do we know what month the ark was taken in and what month it was brought back? The Bible doesn't tell you, but it does tell you. Let's look and see. 1 Samuel, again, 7, 1 and 2, the ark was lodged at Kiriat Urim and a long time passed, 20 years. Remember, it's been 20 years. Okay, so now, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Okay. After that happened, Saul becomes king. Look at 1 Samuel 10, 24. Again, he said to all the people to see him whom the Lord has chosen. There's none like him among the people. And all the people shout, long live the king. Now, that's 1 Samuel 10. The next two chapters, 11 and 12, is establishing Saul as king. Then we see in the next chapter, 13, two years goes by. And Saul offers the sacrifice without waiting for Samuel. God said, wait for me. But Saul was afraid of the Philistines and he offers sacrifice. And then Samuel walks up and he says, guess what? In verse 14, Saul told Saul his kingdom will not continue because of this. But you know what's amazing about this? What tribe were the kings to come from? Judah. But that's not true. It would have been Benjamin. Saul was a Benjamite. But because Saul disobeyed, it went from the tribe of Benjamin to the tribe of Judah. That's something, the interesting thing to think about, the consequence of what he did. Okay, so then what do we see? Now, the Philistines take the ark. We see in 1 Samuel 14, uh, this child is born. His name is Echabod because the glory was taken. Uh, and then his older brother, Ahiah, now becomes priest. And then in verse 35, we see Saul. He's now become king. He builds his first altar to the Lord. And guess what? The Lord doesn't answer him. He doesn't hear a word he says. And then in 1 Samuel 15, the next chapter, Samuel says to Saul, because he would not kill all the Amalekites like God told him, that the Lord has now torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given to a neighbor of yours who's better than you. And so 
in the next chapter, we see Samuel takes this horn of oil and anoints David in the midst of his brethren. Do you remember the story of last week about his mother? And it's a vet. Okay, so now in the midst of his brethren, David is anointed. And it says, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. That's where he lived. In the next chapter, we have the story of Goliath now. In 1 Samuel 17, we see the three oldest sons and Jesse uh, of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. And these were the names of his three sons. And this is when David kills Goliath, and he's about 17 years old. And we see later on in that chapter, in verse 49, David puts his hand in his bag. He takes out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead, and the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. Immediately after that, Saul adopts David. He literally takes him from his house and says, no, you're going to live with me from now on. We see that in 1 Samuel 18, the next chapter, verse 1 and 2. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. But guess what? The very next day, he hated David. It went down quickly. In the next few verses, 7 and 9, all the women were answering one another as they played and danced, and they said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David is ten thousands. And Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him, and he said, David scribe to David ten thousands. But to me, there's only a scribe thousands. What can he have more but the kingdom? And so it says, Saul liked David from that day and forward. And Saul ends up warring with David for about 11 years. And then... Saul dies. And look what happens. It says in 1 Samuel 31, 6, not only did he die and his three sons that were in the battle and his armor bearer and all of his men on the same day together. So David becomes king over Judah at 30 years old. And he rules seven years in Hebron and then 33 years in Jerusalem for a total of 40 years. Now, look at this. It says in 2 Samuel 2, 4, that the men of Judah came and they anointed David king over just the house of Judah, not over Israel. And they told David, saying that the men of Jabesh Gilead were they that buried Saul. Well, guess what? Saul is dead. David is made king over Judah. But now Ishbosheth becomes the king of Israel for two years. And we see in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 8 through 11, that Abner... Who remembers who Abner was? Abner was the general of the army against David. Okay, so Saul picked Abner, a relative, to be the general of his army. And what does the general of the, the army do after Saul dies? Well, it says he took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, brought him to Mahanaim, and he made Ishbosheth king over Gilead, the Asherites, Jezreel, Ephraim, over Benjamin, and over all of Israel. So Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign. All right? Well, he was 10 years older than David. David was 30, and he's 40. And he only reigns two years, but the house of Judah followed David. And at the time, David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah, was seven years and six years months. Now, here's what's fascinating. You got the children of Israel following Saul's son Ishbosheth for two years. And Abner is the general. Who is the general of David's army? Does anyone remember his name? Joab. Exactly. Who is a relative? Okay, so David has his general Joab. Saul had his general Abner, and obviously they're fighting and wanting to kill each other and all this kind of thing. Joab particularly wanted to kill Abner because there's a story in your Bible where Abner killed his brother. So Joab is out for blood, okay? Because Abner killed his brother, Joab's going to kill Abner. Now, I'm going to tell you behind the story that's not in here. You know, talk about as the world turns, soap opera. The Bible's such a soap opera. But well, here's what happens. Abner doesn't like David. He makes 
Ishmael Seth king for two years. Saul's dead. He's been dead for two years. And Abner goes in to talk to Ishmael Seth, who's now the king, Saul's son. Saul had several wives and concubines. It so happens Abner laid with one of Saul's concubines. He's dead. But Ishbosheth reprimands the general of his military for laying with his dad's concubine. And so the military general goes, mm, and he goes and tells King David, I'm going to make sure all of Israel comes to you. Even though he's the general of the army opposing him, because of what Ishbosheth said and reprimanded him, making him embarrassed, he says, okay, I'm just going to turn all of Israel over to David. So he secretly goes over to King David. King David and him make an agreement, and Abner's now going to help King David, and he's going to go back. But on his way back, Joab meets him and kills him. And now David's all upset because here he had made an agreement, and he feels like his blood is on his hand. I mean, it's, it's a soap opera. So anyway, let's look at how this unfolds now. Second Samuel chapter 5, verse 3 through 5. All the elders of Israel come to the king in Hebron. And remember, how long did he rule in Hebron? Seven years. Okay. And then King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over all of Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Hebron over Judah, seven years, six months. In Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over the, all the house of Judah. Now, look what happens. David was in Hebron for how many years? Seven. Now he goes to Jerusalem for 33. When David moves to Jerusalem, he now wants to go get the ark at the house of Abinadab and bring it to Jerusalem. And this is when Uzzah touches it and he dies, okay, because he's trying to keep it from falling. All right. It says in 2 Samuel 6, 2 and 3, David arose and he went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab on the hill. Okay, so here we are. He brought it out 20 years later. They're taking it to Jerusalem. Now look at 2 Samuel 6, 6 through 11. And when they came to Nachshon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God, took a hold of it. The ox had shaken it, and the anger of the Lord was kindled upon Uzzah. And God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. David is upset because the Lord made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of that place Peretz Uzzah to this day. Now David's afraid of the Lord from that day on. And he says, how in the world is I, am I going to get the ark of the Lord to come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto himself into the city of David, but David carried it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom in all of his house. Well, what happens? He reads Torah. And he goes, oh my goodness, the Torah says the Levites have to be the one to carry it. We can't just let any Yahoo carry it, all right? So he go, after reading the Torah, okay, how long had the Torah been around since David became king? Yeah, about 500 years. We're talking a long time. And, he op and they read it and he goes, oh gee, we got to have the sons of Aaron, not just Levites, but the sons of Aaron need to be carrying that. So they grab a hold of the sons of Aaron and now they carry it, they do it right, and it can finally come into the city of David. Okay. So how long was it in the house of Abinadab? 20 years. Okay, so here we go. Here is the Ark of the Covenant. And it is it. Now, you know, what had uh, happened was first it came to uh, one place. And then the citizens of that place looked into it. And 52,000 people died from a plague. And they say, uh, moving on. And so they ended up taking it to Kiryat Yarim. So that's why they took it there, because everyone was looking in the ark. Now, don't look in this one. Just kidding. Okay. And it was after it was taken to Kiryat Yarim that Saul becomes king. Okay. 
20 years goes by, well, actually 18 go by, and then Ishbosheth becomes king for two years, and then after that, David becomes king. So here's the Saul is king after it was put in the house of Abinadab. Then his son Ishbosheth becomes king, and then it comes down to David, and David becomes king and moves the ark. All of that happened within a 20 year time frame. If Ishbosheth was king for two years, that puts it down to 18 years. And if you look at how many years was it from when it went to Kiryat Yerim over to when Saul was anointed, you find out Saul was only king for 13 years. And here are these people come and look at it. 50,000 people are killed. I don't know if it was by lightning or not. But my point is this. You can see all that happened within 20 years. Why does the New Testament say he was king for 40 years? Again, when you study, you can see some obvious errors. And if you want to know the answer to that one, come next week and I'll tell you. <laughs> but this is why you have to study. You can see obvious errors, and this is part of the thing that Danny Ben Gigi and I are doing when we're making our Bible. We're correcting the errors, and then everyone, uh, it's an audio Bible where you can click on a little speaker, and you will hear me tell you what the problem was. So we're really excited about that coming soon. All right, with that said, let's stand.